Amid the 11th century, the Oghuz Turks migrated from their homelands in the Central Asian steppes and into Persia, Mesopotamia, and Anatolia. These conquests were undertaken by one particular group who stylized themselves as the Seljuk Turks. Starting in the year 1037, they carved out an empire in Persia and Mesopotamia, their imperial might clashing with the Byzantine Romans at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, allowing Turkish tribes to settle throughout Anatolia for the coming decades as a consequence. By the late 13th century, the Anatolian Beyliks, or kingdoms, descendants of Turkish settlers who had been populating Anatolia for generations, had managed to retain a semblance of fragmented independence amidst disunity and Mongol invasion. A local personality arose in this terrain, destined to change the course of history with his daring and strategic genius. Osman, the visionary Bey of Bithynia, was acutely aware of Anatolia's disunity. Taking advantage of the opportunity, he recognized the potential for his Beylik to stand above the others. He also looked to the once mighty Byzantine Empire, which had long been plagued by internal strife and external foreign pressures as a susceptible target. Osman used these turbulent circumstances to launch a successful war against the neighboring Byzantines, his son Orhan capturing the city of Bursa in 1326. Unbeknownst to this emerging Ottoman Empire, the seizure of Bursa signaled the beginning of a new chapter in history. Osman's successors continued their relentless expansion, whittling away at Byzantine dominion. With the death of Osman in 1324, Orhan ascended to the throne, building upon and improving Osman's dream of ruling a mighty empire. His conquest provided the necessary foundation to establish the ambitious Ottoman principality as a legitimate state. In 1347, Orhan assisted John Cantacuzenos in usurping the Byzantine throne, which had previously been held by John Palaiologos V. As a reward, the Ottomans were granted unfettered access to raid Thrace. The Ottomans converted Gallipoli into a permanent base for future expansion into Europe, as Orhan's raiding teams maintained a regular presence in the region. Cantacuzenos' demise in 1354 heightened Europe's awareness of the expanding Turkish menace. Murad I, who inherited the throne in 1360, made great advances in Ottoman conquests in Europe through Gallipoli. The Ottoman army would be unable to overcome Constantinople's strong walls and well-positioned defenses, forcing Murad to concentrate his forces to the north. Adrianople, the second most important city in the Byzantine Empire, was conquered and designated as the new Ottoman capital in 1361, serving as the administrative and military center for future expansion. Murad seized Macedonia in 1371, followed by central Bulgaria and Serbia. The pivotal Battle of Kosovo in 1389 marked the conclusion of these gains, with the Serbs suffering a devastating setback. In the Battle of Kosovo, Murad was killed, and his son Bayezid took over. Despite the victory, Bayezid faced obstacles in expanding further into Europe, as his acquisition of more Anatolian territory brought them into direct contact with the Anatolian principality of Karaman. Bayezid's advances attracted the attention of the Turco-Mongol conqueror Timur, who had conquered and slaughtered his way from Central Asia and into Persia. Timur sought to secure a western frontier so he could focus his efforts in India. Bayezid was decisively defeated at the Battle of Ankara in 1402, dying in Timurid captivity within a year. After his victory, Timur left Anatolia as it was politically, assuming a divided Anatolia posed no threat to his ambitions. Timur also left the Ottoman Empire to fend for itself internally, seeing Bayezid's four sons compete for control over the empire during the nearly 11 years of the Ottoman Interregnum. Mehmed, supported by Anatolian Muslim religious orders and artisan guilds, defeated his brothers and assumed complete control as Sultan Mehmed I in 1413. With Mehmed's death in 1421, Murad II took to the throne. Displeased with the power of the Turkish nobles, Murad renewed conflicts with Hungary, going against the wishes of the Turkish nobility. 
Despite victories, the influence of the Turkish nobles led to the Peace of Aderna in 1444, granting Serbia autonomy and retaining Hungarian control over Wallachia and Belgrade. Murad then retired the throne to his son, Mehmed II. Recognizing the weakness of the young Ottoman sultan, the Byzantines, Pope Eugenius IV, Hungary, and Venice organized a crusade against the Ottomans, forcing Murad to return to the throne and defeat them at the Battle of Varna that same year. After resuming the throne, Murad focused on eliminating vassals and establishing direct rule in the Balkans. Only Albania, led by Skanderbeg, resisted the Ottoman conquest. By Murad's death in 1451, the Ottoman Empire seemed firmly established in Europe. Sultan Mehmed II took to the throne, the dream of taking the city of the world's desire and establishing it as the empire's administrative and cultural center strong in his mind. Constantinople, throughout its millennia-long history, successfully defended itself against numerous sieges and attacks. The city's formidable defenses consisted of the Theodosian Walls, a triple row of fortifications built during the reign of Emperor Theodosius II in the 5th century. These walls made Constantinople virtually impregnable. By 1450, the once mighty Eastern Roman Empire had disintegrated down to the lands surrounding Constantinople, as well as the Peloponnese Peninsula. Only 5,000 men were available to man a total of 19 kilometers of Constantinople's walls. The Byzantines were hopelessly outnumbered in men, ships, and weapons. The Ottoman Empire, now led by Mehmed II, posed the greatest threat to Constantinople. The Ottomans had over a hundred cannons, a relatively new weapon at the time, a weapon the Byzantines lacked. Mehmed commenced the siege on April 6, 1453, with the defenders staunchly resisting the Ottoman assaults for six weeks. However, the Ottoman cannons gradually reduced the Theodosian walls to rubble. On May 29th, Mehmed launched a massive assault on Constantinople. The city's defenders, including women and children, fought tooth and nail, but a small gate accidentally left open allowed Ottoman troops to breach the walls. The last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI, led a hopeless charge into the marauding horde, his fate unknown. The rape, pillage, and destruction of the city began. Many civilians committed suicide rather than face the realities of being sold into slavery, a fate some 50,000 unfortunately experienced following the siege. Constantinople's scholars fled to the west in Italy, their expertise building the foundation for the future Italian Renaissance. Mehmed entered the city in the afternoon, putting an end to the destruction. The fall of Constantinople marked the end of the Roman Empire. Mehmed, now the conqueror, established Constantinople as the new Ottoman capital. To many, the fall of Constantinople signified the end of Europe's Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern era. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 also marked the beginning of Ottoman imperial ambitions and gave them control over trade in the area. By controlling the Dardanelles, the Ottomans closed the Silk Road for their western enemies, forcing European merchants to pay heavy taxes to the empire if they wanted to use Ottoman-controlled routes. The Ottomans' control of the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, along with their dominance over the Dardanelles, forced European powers, first the Portuguese, then Spanish, English, French, and Dutch, to seek new trade routes westward, leading to the brutal exploration and colonization of the New World. The empire's reliance on taxes and customs charges as an important source of revenue changed with the Portuguese discovery of a direct sea route to India and beyond in 1488. This allowed European states and merchants to circumvent Ottoman control. As a result, the Ottomans gradually lost their advantage in the east as trade shifted to new sea routes. The decline of the Ottoman Empire's economy and finances was worsened by the diversion of trade from land routes to sea routes. In a desperate attempt to preserve their authority, the newfound rivalry with the Portuguese resulted in intermittent conflicts in the Indian Ocean and even a proxy war in Ethiopia. After the fall of Constantinople, 
Mehmed II restored the physical infrastructure of the city by repairing old buildings, constructing new streets, aqueducts and bridges, modernizing sanitation facilities, and establishing a comprehensive supply system for the city's inhabitants. Mehmed also dedicated considerable effort to expanding his dominions in Anatolia and Europe. He eliminated vassal princes who could challenge his legitimacy, establishing direct Ottoman administration in most provinces across the empire. This, however, came at an expensive price that caused resentment amongst his subjects due to overtaxation and the seizure of property to fund his wars. By Mehmed's death in 1481, he had established ultimate Ottoman rule in Anatolia and southeastern Europe, which would endure for the next four centuries. The Ottoman Empire's rapid conquests can be attributed to its pioneering mindset toward the use of gunpowder weaponry and building its military around its use. At the heart of their military power was the Janissary system, created in the late 14th century by Murad I. Their role was to serve as elite soldiers, as well as skilled administrators and bureaucrats within the Ottoman Empire. The Janissary system was unique in that it involved the conscription of young Christian boys, mostly from the Balkans, through kidnapping and enslavement, who were then converted to Islam and indoctrinated to be loyal to the Sultan, all in a system called Devshirme, or child levy. They were trained as skilled infantrymen and cavalrymen with gunpowder weaponry and swords, one of the key advantages of the Janissary system was that it provided a steady stream of well-trained soldiers for the Ottoman army. Because the Janissaries were taken from conquered territories from a young age, they had no loyalty to any particular flag or ethnic group. Indoctrination made them fiercely loyal to the Ottomans and their sultans, and they were willing to fight and die in defense of the empire. Some parents used the Devshirme system to propel themselves and their families into higher social statuses. Since a child being brought up in the Janissaries guaranteed that child positions in the wealthier upper classes later in life, these parents bribed officers to deliberately take their children. The Ottomans also revolutionized the use of gunpowder weaponry in warfare. The early adoption of cannons and arquebuses in battles and sieges were used to devastating effect, allowing the Ottomans to take down fortifications and other defenses, like those at Constantinople, with ease. To add to this, with the use of the Janissaries, the Ottoman Empire possessed one of the first standing armies in the world. This newfound military superiority allowed the Ottomans to rapidly expand their territory and consolidate their position. The Ottoman army was not entirely comprised of Janissaries, however. As the Ottoman realm expanded, new military corps joined the Turkish army. The Akinsis, or raider cavalry, scouted and launched preemptive raids in enemy territory before the main army's arrival. The Sipahis were elite Ottoman heavy cavalry units, well armored and equipped with lances, paid with land instead of salaries. The light infantry consisted mostly of irregular Azaps, unmarried warriors armed with melee and ranged weapons. The reign of Bayezid II, succeeding Mehmed II as the Ottoman Sultan in 1481, was characterized by a period of consolidation and resolution of internal issues. He resolved the economic problems caused by his father's policies and established a strong foundation for future conquests. Bayezid focused on internal consolidation and implemented equal taxes throughout the empire and restored confiscated property. This was paired with the beginning of a new war chest tax in hopes that future conflicts would not put so much economic strain on his subjects. Beginning in 1492, with the expulsion of Jews from Spain, Bayezid encouraged them to settle in the Ottoman Empire, enabling a golden age for Ottoman Jewry. This, however, coincided with his promotion of the Turkish language and Orthodox Muslim traditions, in hopes of countering the spread of the heterodox Shiism in eastern Anatolia. Selim, Bayezid's son, who succeeded him as Sultan after he died in 1512, advocated an aggressive conquering strategy. Selim began an offensive against Iran's Shia Safavid dynasty, winning the Battle of Chaldiran in 1514. 
Iran was not conquered, however, since the Ottoman army grew discontent and faced inadequate supplies. Nevertheless, the Safavids avoided direct combat with the Ottomans for the following century as a result of their defeat. Selim then turned his attention to the Mamluk Sultanate. With the support of many Mamluk officials, the Ottomans easily defeated the Mamluk army and swiftly conquered Syria, Egypt, and the Hejaz by 1517. With the Islamic holy cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem now all under Ottoman control, Selim sought it fit to take the title of caliph. The Ottoman conquests also granted them access to the intellectual, artistic, and administrative heritage of previous Islamic civilizations. Constantinople became a hub for Muslim intellectuals, artisans, administrators, and artists, further enriching the empire's cultural and religious influence. With the ascension of Selim's son, Suleiman, in 1520, Suleiman assumed the throne with unparalleled power and control over the Devshirme class and the Turkish nobility. With untold wealth and authority, Suleiman's reign is considered the golden age of the Ottoman Empire. The Habsburg dynasty, supported by the Pope in Rome, became Suleiman's main rival in southeastern Europe, as expansionist Ottoman ambitions turned to the Kingdom of Hungary. Suleiman achieved significant victories, capturing Belgrade in 1521 and slaughtering the Hungarian nobles, including King Louis II, at the Battle of Mohács in 1526, resulting in the loss of Hungarian unity and independence. Hungary soon gained autonomy under an anti-Habsburg ruler who accepted Ottoman control. The Habsburgs occupied northern Hungary, but Suleiman's attempt to besiege Vienna in 1529 failed. From 1541 onwards, border conflicts became the norm. With the declining momentum of Ottoman expansion in Europe by 1541, Suleiman shifted focus to the east, further suppressing Shia Safavid influences. Despite seemingly successful campaigns into northwestern Iran, the Ottomans failed to defeat the Iranian army. The Ottoman Empire neared its territorial apex by the end of the 16th century, and thus it ruled over millions of people, with many not all adhering to the Sunni Islamic faith that the state ruled by. Salim himself had elevated the status of the Ottomans from empire to that of caliphate in 1517, a title that carried the weight of being the successors of the Prophet Muhammad, and the representative state of the entire Muslim world, and thusly, Islam was the cornerstone of Ottoman governance. The Ottoman sultans recognized that religious tolerance was a major factor in stability and aimed to maintain peace and tolerance among the people of the book, the Muslims, Christians, and Jews. The millet system protected the rights of non-Muslim communities such as Christians and Jews. Each community had some autonomy in interpreting and implementing the empire's rules. The millet system granted certain privileges to these communities, including their own property, places of worship, and legal authority in internal disputes. Autonomy allowed for these communities to survive and thrive under Ottoman control without the fear of persecution and blatant discrimination. The millet system coincided with the introduction of secular laws known as the Kanun, while the Islamic Sharia law encompasses all necessary laws, there are some instances where it does not apply. In Islamic tradition, if a case falls outside the Sharia's parameters, a judgment can be reached by drawing analogies from relevant Sharia rules or cases. Thus, Kanun laws steps in. The Ottomans elevated Kanun into an independent code of laws, surpassing the significance of the Sharia. Mehmed, the conqueror, collected these laws and divided the Kanun into two sets. One set dealt with the organization of the government and the military, while the other dealt with taxation and the treatment of the peasantry. The Ottoman Kanun reached its final form by 1501, with Suleiman making minimal revisions. However, the laws attained their final form, known as Kanunai Osmani, or the Ottoman laws. Because of this, he attained the nickname of the Lawgiver. Suleiman had a strong passion for architecture and actively promoted the creation of magnificent architectural masterpieces. Ottoman architecture, under Suleiman's patronage, 
beautifully combined Arabic and Persian design elements with the artistic traditions of Byzantine Christianity, resulting in the construction of breathtaking mosques, mausoleums, and madrasas. The pinnacle of Ottoman architecture was witnessed in Constantinople, where a series of mosques, namely the Bayezid and Selim mosques, stood as remarkable examples. These structures, crafted by the renowned Ottoman architect Mimar Sinan, exhibited a harmonious and rational design. They featured an awe-inspiring central dome, gracefully cascading half-domes and slender minarets. Nevertheless, the brilliance of Ottoman architecture witnessed a decline after the 16th century. Subsequent buildings mostly emulated Sinan's architectural style, occasionally incorporating elements from older designs. Ornamental details and smaller structures displayed Turkish Baroque influences, influenced by the Baroque architecture prevalent in Vienna and neighboring regions. As the 18th and 19th centuries unfolded, Ottoman architecture underwent a process of Europeanization. Aside from mosques, secular buildings like baths, caravansaries, and the imperial top copy palace complex in Constantinople held significant importance as exemplars of Ottoman architecture. The Topkapi Palace served as both the Sultan's royal residence and the administrative hub during the 15th and 16th centuries. In Ottoman architectural expression, the decorative elements were often subordinated to the structural forms of the buildings. Various themes and techniques from diverse sources were incorporated, resulting in a visual extravaganza of vibrant colors. A notable decorative feature was the use of Ottoman color tile decoration. While Ottoman miniature painting did not reach the same level of mastery as Persian Safavid painting, it possessed its own distinctive character. It predominantly portrayed religious imagery, often infused with a folk art style, and depicted precise depictions of daily events such as military expeditions and festivals. An exceptional example of this style is the manuscript called Surname I Vebi, which was skillfully painted by Abdul Salil Levni in the early 18th century. The reign of Suleiman marked the peak of Ottoman grandeur, but signs of weakness indicated the beginning of a slow, painful decline. One factor was the diminishing ability and power of the sultans themselves. Suleiman grew tired of his duties and withdrew from public affairs to indulge in the pleasures of his harem. The office of the Grand Vizier, who managed the day-to-day -day governance of the empire, gained more authority but failed to gain the loyalty of different classes and groups in the empire, leading to a decline in the government's effectiveness. The Devshirme system responsible for the Janissary system replaced the Turkish nobility in the mid-16th century, seizing power and controlling the sultans for their benefit. As a result, corruption and nepotism rapidly spread throughout the administration. The princes were kept uneducated and inexperienced to maintain control over them. The Ottoman government faced economic difficulties due to the closure of trade routes, inflation and trade imbalances. The treasury resorted to debasing coinage and increasing taxes, worsening inflation. Corruption and exploitation of state resources continued to further damage the economy. Increased population growth leading into the 1600s, strained resources, and social distress led to disorder. Peasants fled the countryside, exacerbating food shortages. Rebel bands emerged, taking control of parts of the empire, retaining their taxes and cutting off food supplies to cities and Ottoman armies. The central government weakened. These internal weaknesses, however, were only noticeable to astute observers, inside and out. Regardless, Europeans still feared the Ottoman army, albeit to a lesser extent, and it remained strong enough to prevent rebellions and make significant conquests in the east and west. Although the Ottoman navy was initially defeated at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, it managed to rebuild and regain control of the eastern Mediterranean, capturing territories in North Africa. This allowed the Ottomans to maintain fragile peace treaties with Europe, shielding their weaknesses. Despite the internal disturbances, the Ottomans occasionally embarked on new campaigns, such as Sultan Murad, the third's conquest of the Caucasus and Azerbaijan from the Safavids in 1576. 
These victories expanded the empire's territory and provided much-needed financial relief for several decades, allowing them to address their pressing issues. Amidst the fading splendor of an empire grappling with internal strife and external challenges, the 16th and 17th centuries gave rise to the Sultanate of Women, seeing the women from the royal harem exercise their authority and contribute to the empire's cultural, political, and territorial maximums. The harem served as the epicenter of power during this period. Within this exclusive space, concubines, wives, and mothers of the sultans, mostly all of them foreign-born captives, wielded significant influence. Through strategic alliances, intermarriages, and intricate court intrigues, these women often served as power brokers and advisors to their sultans. The origins of the Sultanate of Women can be traced back to the reign of Suleiman and his wife, Hurem Sultan. Hurem, also known as Roxalana, exerted significant influence over Suleiman and became an instrumental figure in shaping his political decisions. Her intelligence, beauty, and diplomatic skills set a precedent for future women to actively participate in the affairs of the empire. Throughout this period, several remarkable women left an indelible mark on Ottoman history. Notable figures include Nurbanu Sultan, the mother of Sultan Murad III, who exercised considerable authority as a regent during her son's reign in the second half of the 16th century. Additionally, Kosem Sultan, the mother of Sultan Ibrahim, and Murad IV, emerged as one of the most influential women in the empire's history, actively participating in the political arena and shaping the fate of the Sultanate. The Sultanate of Women witnessed a dynamic interplay of power between influential women, the sultans, and the Ottoman bureaucracy. These women leveraged their connections, skills, and intelligence to exert influence over crucial political decisions, court appointments, and even military campaigns. Their involvement in state affairs often extended beyond the harem, leading to a notable shift in the power dynamics within the empire. The Sultanate of Women's position began to decline following the death of Turhan Hatice Sultan, daughter of Kosem, in 1683, as the Grand Viziers of the Ottomans increasingly gained more power. As a result, the influential roles played by women gradually diminished, and the empire reverted to a more traditional male-dominated political structure. Reforms in the 17th century were initiated by Sultans Osman II and Murad IV, as well as the influential Koprulu Grand Viziers, who served under Mehmed IV. Losses at the hands of the Austrians in Hungary, a rising Safavid threat in the east, and further conflicts with the Venetians prompted the ruling Devshirme class to accept reforms, although they were limited in nature. The reforms aimed to restore the previous system of government and society, but were not enough to halt the decline of the empire. The reforms were only allowed to address the consequences of decay, not its root cause, the Devshirme's monopoly. Once the immediate difficulties were resolved, the old groups regained power. Additionally, the reformers underestimated the growing power of Europe. This partial revival through the reforms boosted confidence in the strength of the military, leading to the Second Siege of Vienna in 1683. The defenders, led by Polish King John Sobieski, not only repelled the Ottomans, but also formed a coalition that would later weaken the Ottoman Empire in the 18th century. Historic rivals of the Ottomans, such as the Habsburgs, Venice, and Russia, sought to regain territories and extend their influence. France and Sweden, along with Britain and the Netherlands, supported the Ottoman Empire to prevent any one power from dominating Europe, as well as to protect their individual economic interests. As a result, Russia and Austria fought intermittent wars with the Ottomans from 1683 to 1792. The Ottomans suffered ailing losses in Hungary, Wallachia, Transylvania, and the Black Sea coast, and had to allow the two European powers to intervene on behalf of Christian subjects, increasing European influence in Ottoman affairs. Many people living under Ottoman rule were resistant to change and reforms because they benefited financially from the chaos and the weakened authority of the Sultan. 
they were unaware of the advancements made by Europeans in various fields, such as industry, business, science, technology, politics, and the military. Despite this lack of awareness, the Ottomans held a self-centered and even narcissistic belief in their superiority. The Ottomans primarily encountered Europeans on the battlefield, and their defeats were often blamed on their failure to effectively utilize their skills. As a result, in the 18th century, attempts to introduce reforms mirrored previous Ottoman reforms, occasionally incorporating undoubtedly superior European military organizations, weaponry, and procedures. During the 18th century, some people in the Ottoman Empire had limited contact with the Western world, which had only modest effects. European traders and travelers interacted with the Ottomans, and Ottoman intellectuals had exchanges with their Western counterparts. However, these interactions had limited consequences and did not represent the general attitude of the Ottomans at the time. In 1717, a period known as the Tulip Period began, during which some Ottomans started adopting European fashion, and the imperial palace began to imitate European court life. Sultan Ahmed III built lavish summer residences, and his entourage followed suit by organizing numerous garden parties reminiscent of Versailles. The court poet Nadim embraced this new era and expressed it in his poems, which were inspired by his surroundings and love for nature. Tulip farming became a popular pastime during this period, symbolizing the influence of Western culture and giving the era its name. Printing of books in the Turkish language began in the empire in 1727, focusing mainly on history and geography. Although traditional scribes occasionally opposed this and led to intermittent closures of printing presses, it did contribute to increased literacy among the educated population. With Sultan Selim III's rise to power in 1789, the process of westernization and modernization continued in the Ottoman Empire. Selim III introduced a new European-style army called the Nizam-e-Sedid, meaning New Order, after unsuccessful attempts to reform the Janissary Corps and the Devshirme system. This newly formed army, under the guidance of European commanders, received independent payment and support from various European nations. Additionally, Selim III established factories and technical institutions to produce weapons and train commanders. However, resistance from the Devshirme nobility limited the size and effectiveness of the new army. In 1798, Selim's attention shifted away from the reforms when a young Napoleon Bonaparte led a French expedition to Egypt. Despite achieving success in this endeavor with the assistance of Great Britain and favorable natural circumstances, Selim's authority was undermined by the emergence of nationalism among Ottoman subject peoples and ongoing disputes. His shortcomings and lack of support eventually led to his removal from power by the Janissaries in 1807, marking the end of his reform efforts. Although Selim's reforms were temporarily set aside, they laid the foundation for increased Western understanding and influence in the Ottoman Empire. The presence of Westerners, along with the establishment of colleges for the new army, helped alleviate the empire's isolation. These developments set the stage for significant changes that would reshape the empire throughout the 19th century. With Mahmud II's ascension in 1808, the sick man of Europe, as it began to be called by its European contemporaries, was facing a dire situation. In Egypt, the Ottoman viceroy Muhammad Ali effectively seized control of the region in 1804 and began to establish his own power. In Iraq and Syria, local governors only paid lip service to the Ottoman government. In Anatolia, only two provinces were firmly under central control, while powerful local leaders in southern Albania and northern Bulgaria held power. Serbia had been in open revolt since 1804. Externally, the empire faced threats from Russia and Britain. Selim III had sought French aid to reclaim lost territory, leading to war with Russia and Britain. Russia invaded the Danubian principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia in 1806, and Britain attempted to seize the Dardanelles and invaded Egypt in 1807. Despite these challenges, the Ottomans benefited from the preoccupation of European powers with other interests. 
Britain made peace in 1809, and Russia returned the principalities to Ottoman rule, except for most of Bessarabia through the Treaty of Bucharest in 1812. The Ottomans' exit from the Napoleonic Wars allowed Mahmud to focus on internal reforms to strengthen the Ottoman Empire against European powers and local leaders. He faced opposition from the Janissaries, and in 1826, got rid of the Janissaries once and for all in what became known as the Auspicious Incident. Mahmud's reforms included modernizing the army, centralizing political power, and implementing European-style ministries. The reformed army became a tool for political centralization and stimulated further reforms in education, taxation, and administration. Mahmud also sought to curb rival powers. He extended Ottoman control over various regions but faced challenges from Muhammad Ali of Egypt, seeing Muhammad Ali's successful invasion be thwarted by the threat of Russian intervention. Once again, war broke out against the two in 1839, the Ottoman offensive failing and seeing the European powers conceive the Treaty of London in 1840, granting the Ottomans Syria, but securing Muhammad Ali's position in Egypt. To add to this, a revolt in Greece starting in 1821 led to more European intervention, guaranteeing Greek independence by 1832 with the destruction of the Ottoman fleet at the Battle of Navarino five years prior. At the same time, Russian opposition hindered Ottoman attempts to regain control of Serbia and the Danubian principalities, resulting in the Russo-Turkish War of 1828 to 1829. The Ottomans were forced to give up the mouth of the Danube to Russia. They also granted new privileges to the Danubian principalities and Serbia. Serbian autonomy was finalized in 1833. Despite the territorial losses and the diminished Ottoman position, Mahmud's reign marked a turning point in Ottoman modernization. In 1839, under the leadership of Abdul Makid I, the Tanzimat reforms were initiated to transform the Ottoman Empire from a theocratic system into a modern state following the European model. The main objective of the Tanzimat reforms was to establish new institutions that would ensure the security and rights of all subjects within the empire, regardless of their religion or race. It sought to introduce a standardized tax system, fair military conscription practices, and improved training for the armed forces. While the promised equality for non-Muslims was not always fully realized, several significant changes were implemented. These included the development of a secular school system, the reorganization of the army, the creation of representative assemblies, and the introduction of new commercial and criminal laws based on French models. Importantly, these laws were administered by independent state courts, separate from the religious council. However, the momentum of the Tanzimat reform movement began to slow down in the mid-1870s during the reign of Abdulaziz. The concentration of power in the hands of the Sultan hindered further progress as Abdulaziz began to abuse his authority and pursue regressive policies. Despite this setback, the Tanzimat reforms laid the groundwork for the gradual modernization of the Ottoman state, giving hope that the empire could shake off its reputation as the sick man of Europe. Implementing the Tanzimat reforms faced various challenges, including financial constraints and a shortage of skilled individuals needed to drive the changes. Traditionalists within the empire opposed the reforms, arguing that they undermined the Islamic identity of the empire. Moreover, European powers hindered the centralization process by blocking Ottoman attempts to regain control over regions such as Bosnia and Montenegro in 1853. While Britain and France initially supported the Ottomans during the Crimean War, the subsequent peace settlement did not bring significant benefits to the empire. Instead, it contributed to the unification of the Danubian principalities and the eventual emergence of an independent Romania, further complicating the Ottoman Empire's position. In the years 1873 to 1874, the Ottoman peasants experienced hardships brought upon by both droughts and floods. 
These natural disasters added to the existing challenges they faced, such as an oppressive landholding system in the Balkans, increased taxation, and conscription resulting from military reorganization in 1869. The burden of the Ottoman debt further worsened the already strained tax situation. By 1875, the public debt had reached a staggering 200 million pounds, with annual payments of 12 million pounds surpassing the national revenue. The financial crisis of 1873 left the Ottomans capable of meeting only half of their obligations. As discontent grew in the Balkans, nationalist agitation found support from Serbia and Slav organizations. Uprisings erupted in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1875 and Bulgaria in 1876. The Ottoman attempts to suppress these uprisings resulted in war with Serbia and Montenegro, compelling European powers to exert pressure for reforms. Despite efforts, the European powers failed to reach a consensus, and in the April of 1877, Russia declared war unilaterally. The Ottomans suffered defeat, but their resistance at Plevna enabled other European powers led by Britain to intervene. The Treaty of San Stefano in 1878 acknowledged the independence of Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro, while imposing territorial concessions, administrative reforms, and an indemnity on the Ottomans. However, at the Congress of Berlin later that summer, European pressure led to modifications of the treaty. Bulgaria's size was reduced, dividing it into two parts, and the gains of Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania were curtailed. Austria-Hungary gained control of Bosnia and Herzegovina, while Cyprus came under British rule through a separate convention. This settlement represented a significant defeat for the Ottomans, resulting in territorial losses and increased European influence. The empire also faced new financial controls aimed at reducing its debt, leading to the establishment of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, or OPDA, to oversee debt collection. The OPDA played a role in Ottoman affairs and facilitated European investment. While it imposed restrictions on resource allocation and worked alongside European banks and tariff limitations, the burden of debt repayments did not overwhelmingly drain the empire's resources. The construction of a national constitution, the first complete Ottoman constitution and the first in any Islamic country, was perhaps the most significant development of the Great Eastern Crisis. The Sultan played a crucial role in its creation, as it originated from his will, granting him comprehensive executive authority. The Constitution introduced a two-chamber parliament, representing a progressive step. The lower house was indirectly elected, while the upper house was appointed by the Sultan. Despite undergoing several revisions, the Constitution did not diminish the Sultan's dominant powers, both within the framework of the Constitution and in broader matters. He maintained a position of authority. However, it is worth noting that the Constitution's effectiveness was relatively short-lived, lasting only two years from its drafting. After the Great Eastern Crisis in the 1870s, when the influence of European powers in the Ottoman Empire grew, a group called the Committee of Union and Progress, or CUP, or the Young Turk Movement, emerged in 1889. The members of this movement sought revolution, advocating for liberal ideas, reform, and a strong central government. The Young Turk Revolution of 1908 originated in Macedonia, where its followers demanded the restoration of the constitution. Sultan Abdul Hamid's attempts to suppress the movement backfired and instead led to the announcement of the constitution's restoration. The revolution was driven by young officers and civilian supporters who aimed to protect the Ottoman Empire from European intervention. Alongside this fear, personal grievances and dissatisfaction with low salaries and limited opportunities for advancement fueled their discontent. However, they lacked a detailed plan of action and relied on the existing bureaucrats for governance. In the April of 1909, an army mutiny occurred in Constantinople known as the the 31st of March incident. This mutiny exposed the weakness of the sea up, but also presented a new opportunity for change. The mutiny arose from soldiers' discontent with their living conditions, neglect by ambitious officers, 
and resistance to perceived non-Muslim influences. The government's weakness allowed the mutiny to spread, and although order was eventually restored, an army from Macedonia occupied Istanbul. As a result, Abdul Hamid was removed from power and Sultan Mehmed V took his place. The constitution was amended to transfer real power to the parliament. Going forward, the army became the true decision makers in Ottoman politics. The Ottoman Empire experienced significant challenges due to the foreign strategy pursued by the Young Turks, resulting in more unfortunate consequences. After the revolution of 1908, numerous nations took advantage of the situation to further their own interests. Austria-Hungary, for instance, successfully conquered Bosnia and Herzegovina, while Bulgaria gained independence. Italy also seized control of Tripoli, and the Dodecanese Islands. Between 1912 and 1913, the Ottoman Empire in Europe faced devastating consequences from the Balkan Wars. The Ottomans lost a considerable portion of their European territories to Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, Montenegro, and Albania. Although the Ottomans managed to reclaim some parts of Eastern Thrace through the Second War, which involved Bulgaria against the aforementioned Balkan nations, the empire still suffered significant territorial and demographic losses in its European provinces. The Ottoman Empire entered World War I primarily due to the influence exerted by Germany, which had been steadily influencing the empire since the early 1900s. In October of 1914, the Ottomans bombarded the Russian Black Sea ports, prompting the Entente powers to declare war shortly thereafter. During the war, the Ottomans made significant contributions to the Central Powers. Turkish troops played a crucial role in the Gallipoli Campaign of 1915, where they effectively tied down many Entente forces. What was initially thought to be a quick and hasty capture of Constantinople turned into a grueling 10-month-long trench warfare struggle, ultimately leading to Ottoman victory and the downfall of the British government in power at the time. Amidst the chaos of war, the young Turks in power also saw an opportunity to further centralize and homogenize their rule. Tragically, this included the targeted massacre and forced deportation of the Armenian community in eastern Anatolia. This horrific event, known as the Armenian Genocide, unfolded between 1915 and 1923 and resulted in the loss of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Armenian lives. As the war progressed, desertions from the Ottoman army increased and economic pressures mounted. With the resignation of the government, the Ottomans signed the Armistice of Mudros on October 30, 1918, marking the end of their involvement in the war. Throughout the conflict, the Entente powers devised various agreements to divide the territories of the Ottoman Empire amongst themselves. The Sykes-Picot Agreement, among others, outlined the partitioning of these territories, granting specific areas to Russia, France, Britain, and Italy, and in the process making false promises of a unified Arab nation. At the same time, British support was pledged for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine with the Balfour Declaration. Even though the legal Ottoman government in Constantinople which was ruled by Mehmed VI from 1918 to 1922, believed that resisting the demands of the Allied forces was impossible, there were still pockets of resistance in Anatolia after the armistice of Mudros. Mustafa Kemal, a successful Ottoman officer during the Great War, took charge of organizing this resistance, despite facing opposition from the official government. Congresses were held in Erzurum and Sivas, leading to the formation of the Association for the Defense of the Rights in 1919, with Mustafa Kemal as its chairman. The Kemalists put pressure on the government, which resulted in the resignation of the Grand Vizier and the approval of the National Pact. The Kemalists had to deal with uprisings, Ottoman forces, and hostility from the Greeks, but they managed to establish a legitimate governing body, the Grand National Assembly in Ankara. They successfully quelled local uprisings, repelled Greek advances, and resisted Italian occupation, 
which earned them recognition from European powers. Ultimately, the nation of Turkey achieved a comprehensive settlement with the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. With the declaration of a republic and the abolishment of the over 600-year-old Ottoman Sultanate, a new political system was initiated. Mustafa Kemal became the first president and acquired the nickname Ataturk in the process. Additionally, the significant title of the Islamic Caliphate, which had been held by the Ottomans since their conquest of the Mamluks in 1517, with its millennia-long history of prosperity, faith, conquest, and decline, was abolished in 1924.